Good morning, River Church. How are you all doing today? Uh, my name is Pastor Billy, and I will be uh, leading us this morning uh, through our message. Uh, we're going to be in Jonah chapter 1, uh, verses 17. So the last verse in Jonah through all of chapter 2. And uh, we're going to be talking about a repentant heart. Um, so you may have heard this in the news. Michael Packard. Does that name sound familiar? He is a fisherman in the Cape Cod area, area in, in, on the East Coast. Uh, he's a fisherman and he, he fishes for lobsters. And so he's, I guess he's actually a diver. But so what he'll do is he'll dive down and he does it the old school way where he doesn't use nets or anything like that. He, he dives down, he grabs the lobsters by hand, he brings them back up to the boat and that's how, that's how he fishes. It's actually kind of cool. And so Michael Packard was uh, doing this, and he and his, his, his fishing partner uh, were doing this. And, and they go out, and, and again, they collect these lobsters, and they sell them, and that's their livelihood. And so he was, um, he was doing this, and he had done this a few times. They had, at this point, uh, during this one, uh, this one fishing trip that they had, he had uh, collected about already a few hundred pounds of lobster and so he was going down for his third dive and uh, so he's descending and he gets about 30 to 45 feet down and as he's getting closer to the lobster he says he just feels like he gets hit by a freight train like he just this boom like this most uncomfortable impactful feeling that he experienced right and so Feels like he gets hit by an a, train, uh, a freight train. He's disoriented. Uh, he trying to gather his bearings. Uh, what he realized, what he, he immediately thinks is like, oh man, I just got eaten by a shark. <laughs> this is not going to be good. Um, and but what he realizes that there was no, there was no teeth marks, no teeth bites on him. And so he's like, okay, I guess the shark didn't get me. And then he quickly realized that he was eaten by a whale now well, that's what the headlines say uh, but 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 he'll say quick he'll be quick to say that he was not swallowed by the whale he was just in the whale's mouth and so um he's in there you know I, I mean i don't even know what it would be like to 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 experience that um i could imagine that time just is going by so slowly uh i i don't, I don't even know all the thoughts that you would think but he did say while he was in while he was inside the the whale's mouth, um, you know, he, he thought like this is it. He thought this is how I'm gonna go. Uh, he started thinking about his kids, his family. Um, all the while, just water is rushing on him. He said the water was coming so fast over him, and and he thought that was it. And uh, he said after about 40 seconds or less than a minute that the whale, uh, he, he was able to get out of the whale's mouth. The whale uh, let him go and uh, his partner pulled him back on, on, on the boat. And it's just a crazy story. You know, we read about it. And we're going to read about that story of Jonah today, but you hear about stories like that and you're like, man, that's crazy. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's, it's a little bit, I think, not as surprising as we may think we'll get into all that here in just a bit uh, before we get into our story of Jonah and before we get into uh, the talking about a repentant heart I want to recap a little bit about what we discussed last week and so last week we were in the first chapter of Jonah now if you guys remember Jonah uh, is a prophet and a prophet's job was to receive word from the Lord and to go tell people of this word Right. And it was usually some sort of warning like, hey, if you do, if you don't turn around, if you don't stop being evil, then bad stuff is going to happen to you. Right. This is what the uh, the um, the prophets, this is what their job usually was. And so Jonah, the Lord told Jonah to go to Nineveh. He said, you're going to go to Nineveh and you're going to speak out, call them out for their sin. Now, as we learned last week. Jonah did not want to do this at all, right? God said to travel northwest, north, I'm sorry, northeast in about, uh, about 500 miles, right? Instead, he travels 
east, as far east as he could go, about 2,500 miles, right? The Lord said, go this way, uh, and, and Jonah goes the other way, right? He goes in the complete opposite direction. And if you remember, he goes the furthest west that you could possibly go um, during, the, during that time period, right? That was of the known world, of what had been discovered of the, of the, of the world. That was the furthest west that you could travel. That's where, uh, that's where he went. And so in his rebellion, in his hardened heart, uh, he was refusing the Lord. He hops on a ship. He travels as far west as he can go. And as he's on this ship, the ship starts to get, uh, or, or the waters start to get rough, right? They start to, the waves start to increase and it starts to get a little more violent, a little more turbulent on, on, the, on, the, on the water. And so Jonah is like, oh man. So he goes down to the, the bottom of the ship and he takes a nap. And so as this is happening, the, the, um, the seas, the text says, they grow more and more tempestuous against them. The, 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 the ship is described as potentially going to break uh, because of how violent the, the, the shores are. I'm sorry, the waters are. And everybody is, you know, they're, they're, nobody on the, on, the, on, the, on the boat is a Christian except for Jonah. Nobody believes in God except for Jonah. And all of these other people are praying to their gods. They're doing whatever they can. They're crying out for help. And the person that should be doing those things, Jonah, is asleep. He's isolated, asleep by himself. And so the captain of the ship is like, dude, what are you doing? You got to pray to your God. Maybe your God has some answers. And sure enough, um, uh, Jonah doesn't pray, but he says, this is all happening because of me. Throw me overboard and you guys will be all right. All right? And so he's still running from his, his issues. He's still running from his problems. He's not, he's not being obedient to the Lord. He's trying to run from the Lord still and says, throw me overboard. And so the, the sailors reluctantly, they say, you know what? I don't want to throw you overboard. Lord, please wash this guy's hands from us. We do not want to do this. Um, but they throw him overboard. The waters settle. Everything calms down. And Jonah is falling to his death in the water. And so in this story, or the story last week, one of the main points that we talked about was I wanted to urge us to stop running from the Lord and to return to the Lord, returning to the Lord in prayer, right? Stop running from Him, but turn back towards Him. And the way I encourage us to do this is just to pursue Him in prayer. So we're going to build on that today. We're going to, we're going to develop that a little bit further, but... <clears throat> And in doing so, as we jump into our passage today, we're going to look at what a repentant heart looks like. So last week we talked about this turning back, this being repentant, this praying to the Lord. This week we're going to talk about what that looks like. Okay, and so we're going to do that. And by the end of this, my hope is that we'll have a few practical steps to help us have a more repentant heart, a more repentant posture towards the Lord. So uh, we're going to be in Jonah chapter 1. Again, it's the last verse in chapter 1 and then all of chapter 2. Jonah chapter 1 verses 17 reads this. It says, And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, I want to stop here. I want to take a break. Uh, I want to point something out before we actually study what is happening here. But many people who read this passage, uh, if they have an issue with Jonah, it is because of this passage, right? Jonah being eaten by a whale, right? This whole section, this whole portion, chapter 2 of Jonah, is a problem for people. 
Okay? Some people think it's a fictional story. Uh, they think it is a story that just has some moral principle, uh, but, but they don't believe it to be a factual story. They believe it to be impossible. Perhaps, perhaps it is impossible, but, but you know what else is impossible? Creating something from nothing, having the blind see, having the lame walk, going from death to life, raising from the grave, forgiving sins. Right? Our God does the impossible. And so to go along with this story, I think that it is completely possible for God to do this. Right? To go along with this, Jesus even speaks of this story as being a factual story. In Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 to 41, it reads, <clears throat> Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. But he answered them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh, Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. So Jesus is speaking of Jonah as a factual story. He's saying, you wicked people, you want to sign? What more sign do you want? I've already given you the sign. You've already read the sign. You already know about the sign of Jonah. So if you still have uh, issues with this, if you're still having uh, a hard time believing, then uh, that's the least of our worries, and we have bigger fish to fry. <laughs> Sorry. I, I wanted to say that pun so bad. Um, but, but, but seriously, we do have bigger fish to fry. In all seriousness, this story is an actual account of Jonah being eaten by a big fish. We have no reason to believe that this story is false. Okay, so I just wanted to, to clarify that before we get into the text, okay? So we're going to go back. I'm going to read Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. And again, it says, uh, And the great, I'm sorry, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. How gracious is our God? But Jonah doesn't see that, right? He's probably thinking that he can escape this call from the Lord. He jumps overboard to his certain death. He's thinking he's going to die. And then he gets eaten, swallowed by this great fish, right? He would rather die. He would rather die, in, uh, <clears throat> die this way than to see the Ninevites repent. He would rather do this. And the Lord says, no, that's not going to happen, and he saves his life. How gracious is this? Right? Jonah did nothing, did nothing to deserve for his life to be spared. He was in complete opposition to God. He was not following God. He was not doing what the Lord was wanting him to do. He was in complete, complete rebellion against God to the point where he wanted himself to die. But the Lord saves his life. How gracious is God to Jonah? How gracious is God to us despite our rebellion? Beautiful picture there. Moving on uh, to chapter 2. It says, <clears throat> chapter 2, we're going to read the whole chapter. It says, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into 
the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me, and your waves and your billows passed over me. Verse 4, Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. At the roots of the mountains, I went down to the land whose bars closed up, I'm sorry, closed upon me forever, yet you brought me up I'm sorry, yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Verse 7, when my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love, but I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish and had vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. So up to this point, chapter 2, up to this point, this is the first prayer from Jonah to the Lord. Right? There was plenty of opportunity for, the, for Jonah to seek the Lord in chapter 1. But that doesn't happen. And so in this distress, in this moment, this is his first time that he is praying to God. Right? Any other time, any other moment in the story so far would have been a great time. But this time is the time that he decides to do that. Now, this prayer, if you look at it, this prayer is a very beautiful prayer. Right. It looks like, it reads like, if you have your Bibles, it reads like something that you would see in the Psalms. In fact, in its genre, in its type of literature, in its style, it is a psalm. Okay? It, 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 it is a psalm, though it's not found in the Psalms. It is a psalm. It is a, a song. It is a prayer. Now, uh, there are many different types of uh, psalms in in the Bibles, there are psalms of uh, ascent, psalms of lament, psalms of thanksgiving. Right, there are many different types of songs. As, as psalms, as people are writing the psalms, uh, they have different m reasons for writing them, and so you can determine the different types of psalms by their structure, how they're put together, how they're composed. Jonah's prayer, Jonah's psalm, is a psalm of thanksgiving. And this is evidenced by its structure. Now, a psalm of thanksgiving will usually contain some sort of introduction. There's an intro. Uh, it will contain a, uh, a statement articulating past distress. It will have a cry out to the Lord, and it would... Uh, there would be an acknowledgement on God's end, for the fourth one, an acknowledgement on God's end and his acts towards deliverance, delivering the, 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 the person. Um, and this would cause the people to be thankful. Right? And so we see that structure uh, in, in, in Jonah's prayer. In verse 2, we see his introduction, right? In verses 3 through 6, the, the, the Lord, I'm sorry, Jonah is distressed. Right? He's talking about being, being uh, seaweed being wrapped around him. He's talking about uh, being se potentially separated from God. He's talking about being engulfed by the waters. Right? Uh, verse 7 is his cry for help. Right? He's at the point of death. His life is ebbing away, and he cried out to the Lord. Right? Lord, help me, please. <clears throat> Right, and then verse eight and nine is God's actions, His His delivering. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, God in the way that He acts, and, and God uh, or, or Jonah praising God for for who He is. Right, um, jo Jonah was saved from drowning in the sea. Jonah confessed God's grace. 
Um, and, and we see that God's lo uh, loyalty, he's expressing these things and he's, he's, he's saying, Lord, you are faithful and I'm going to commit my vows to you. So there's no doubt from this structure, there's no doubt that there is a, uh, that this is a prayer of thanksgiving, right? Acknowledging who God is and being thankful for that. Now, as you look at this, as you study this passage that Jonah just read, it's interesting. An interesting note is, is that these words are not necessarily Jonah's words. All of these verses are, are pulled from other parts of the Psalms. So it's this really, really pretty picture of, of Jonah using the word of the Lord to pray to the Lord. It's a beautiful thing. I would encourage us to do that in our prayer. One of the best ways to pray is to open up the Psalms, read the Psalms, and pray through the Psalms. It's such a beautiful thing. And we see, we see Jonah doing that here. But, <laughs> there is a but, but <clears throat> it's not that simple though. Right? If we've gathered anything from Jonah by now, it's that Jonah is a bit odd. The story of Jonah is a bit odd. It's a bit off. There's nothing ever seems like uh, it's going the way that it should, right? People aren't behaving the way that they should. Characters aren't doing the things that they should be doing. And that is happening in this passage. Right? And as I said, it's, it's a beautiful thing what we see in Jonah's prayer. It's really, man, it's a really pretty prayer. But there are some odd things or some strange things. The first thing is that Jonah waits three days before he starts to pray. Right? It says that he was in the belly of the fish for three days. And, and, and then the next verse says, then he prayed out to the Lord. And so there's this, there's this period, there's this moment of why didn't Jonah pray immediately? <laughs> right? As, as I'm going, I, I know he wanted to go overboard. But as, I, as I'm going overboard, I'm already praying. I'm like, Lord, please help me. I'm sorry. This is crazy. Right? Then to be inside the whale's or the big fish's mouth. Lord, I'm sorry, please. <laughs> but he waits three days. He waits three days and then prays. And it's interesting. I mean, I could speculate as to what his thoughts were. But I just think that it's interesting that he waits three days before he actually cries out to the Lord. Before he... he uh, he, he seeks the Lord. So that's the first thing. He waits three days. The second problem with his, with his prayer is that he doesn't even repent of his sin. He says all these beautiful things, but he doesn't even get to the heart of the issue. Are you familiar with the phrase, oh, let's just sweep everything under the rug? You may have grown up in a house or you may be living in a house right now where when people get upset or when something bad happens or when there's anger or just whatever happens, uh, some, some, some sort of conflict happens in your household, nobody talks about it. Everybody just gets quiet, right? The issues, uh, they, 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 they sweep them under the rug. Nobody talks to each other for like a week, right? Everybody's like not making eye contact with each other, right? You wait till the person who's mad looks away and then you kind of look at their eyes to get the gauge. Is this person still upset? Is Okay, they're still upset. I'm going to look over here now. And, then, and you just do this dance. <laughs> it's exhausting. Oh man, but you do this dance and, 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 and you try and sweep everything under the rug and then a week later, uh, some time goes by uh, and then all of a sudden, like, everybody's talking again. It's like nothing ever happened. It's like, wait a second, something just happened. What just happened? We need to talk about it, but we don't and we sweep things under the rug. Let me give you guys a little bit of insider information that does not work. It, it doesn't work. 
You know, I've tried this with the lease before. Um, <clears throat> we were at a party, or at, we were at our house, we were hosting a party, and, uh, you know, I, I talk about a lot of arguments that me and my wife have. I love my wife. She's like the most amazing woman in the world. Um, and when we do have arguments, when we do have arguments, it's usually because I'm a knucklehead, right? <laughs> but we were in this disagreement about something, and it wasn't a big deal, but we were just on opposite ends of an issue, and there was tension. And normally, me and my wife, we try to like hash it out quickly, and it's awkward and it's uncomfortable, but it's just the best for everybody if we just hash it out immediately. And uh, at first, it was really hard for me to do, and I've grown in this area in my life where we're able to, and my wife as well, we're able to just like, okay, put our emotions down, put all this stuff down, let's talk about what just happened. And so, uh, but we were in this argument and people were coming over. And so there wasn't a whole bunch of time to like settle the issue. And so as we are uh, in this conflict, you know, me and my wife are kind of like avoiding each other in the house and that sort of thing. And then people start to come. And then so people are at the house and everything is good. Everybody's happy. Everybody's hanging out and they're and having a great time. And, and there are times where I'm sitting at the table and Lisey's sitting with me and our friends are sitting across the table and we're all just talking and it's, it's great. I'm like, oh, my wife, I love my wife. She's so great. I right, think and everything is great. Then everybody leaves. And I'm like, hey, sweetheart, we're going to have a good time. And she still gives me the, we need to talk. And I'm like, oh, man, you're right. Can't we just forget about it? <clears throat> but it, it doesn't work. Need to resolve these issues. And, 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 and we did, and we are, we're fine. But Jonah, in this story, Jonah, he tries to sweep things under the rug. And the problem with that is that the mess is still there. The mess, the mess needs to be cleaned. We see this beautiful picture in this passage of God saving Jonah despite Jonah's wickedness. Right? We see God's grace in Jonah's life despite his rebellion towards God. And what I want to read to us in this, uh, from this passage, uh, or in light of this passage, I want to read to us from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 26 and 27. It says, For if we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the knowledge of truth, then, there's, then there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a fearful expectation of judgment and a fury of fire that will consume the adversaries. So there's, there's already been grace in Jonah's life expressed here, and he continues in sin despite this grace that has been given to him. And the, the, the author of Hebrews, what we just read, says... That, be careful because there's, there's, no, there's no second sacrifice, right? There's no second, there's no, there's no, once you've been forgiven of sin, there's no like ultra secondary, like I'm going to continue in sin despite this. There's no, it's Jesus is the sacrifice. That's it. That's it. <clears throat> so what happens as a result of, G, of Jonah's rebellion, of the mess still being there, of him continuing in sin, Despite God's grace, we're going to read Jonah chapter 2, verse 10. It says, And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. The fish vomited Jonah up. There are many ways that the Lord could have gotten Jonah, delivered Jonah from the belly of the fish, right? He could have transported him out of the belly of the fish. Right? He could have had the, the fish uh, come up to the shore and open its mouth and Jonah walk out gracefully. There are many different ways that the Lord could have gotten Jonah out of the belly of the fish. But it says that the fish vomited Jonah up. 
Now this illustration that we're going to talk about right now, it's about vomiting, so be warned. <clears throat> I'll try not to get too graphic, although the more we can understand about, about this, I think the better it would be. But it's going to be about vomiting. And so what usually happens when you eat something that makes you, it makes you vomit, right? Uh, for starters, at least most of us, if we knew it was going to be, uh, if it was going to end this way, then we would avoid eating it. Right, but, but you usually don't know that that is going to be the end result. What happens, right? You eat this food, and it's usually something that you want. It's usually something you like. It usually tastes really good, and you enjoy the meal. Right? Then once it hits your stomach, you get that first like rumble, like a and you're like, what was that? Who was that? Who was that? Was that me? <laughs> you get that first rumble. And you look down in your, in your stomach, you think, uh-oh, here we go, right? And you carry on about your day, but as you do, your stomach becomes more and more unsettled. And at some point, you can't take it anymore. Your body's like, I'm done with this, and up comes your food. Now, that is, that is what happened. That is the image we should see with Jonah, Right while inside the belly of the fish, he begins to pray. And during this prayer, he continues to offer what he thinks are wonderful sounding prayers to the Lord. But, but it's as though with each passing phrase, the food, Jonah's words, become more and more toxic, right? Uh, verse 7, When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you in your holy temple. I can just feel, hear the way, like, Ugh, right? Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. Ugh, ugh. Right when I when, but but I with the voice of thanksgiving will sacrifice to you, like this is almost the last. Oh, it's, I feel it right here in my chest. Right, <clears throat> what I have vowed to, what I have vowed I will pay. <clears throat> Salvation belongs to the Lord, and then up comes all the food. Right, and it's and it's if you think about it. Here he is saying that salvation belongs to the Lord, but you see from this story that Jonah wants salvation to belong to him. He doesn't want to go save the Ninevites. He doesn't want to go speak to them. It's a very, very sickening statement. Some of us, me, us, we, together, are this way. Before we get into that, I just want to say that this word vomit, it would not have been lost on the original readers. Right? They have heard this, this word, this idea, this phrase before. Leviticus 18, 24 and 25 says... Do not make, and so this is uh, the, the, the Leviticus, this is Leviticus, this is the nation of Israel, and it's like, just become a nation. They're in the, they're in the, the, uh, the uh, wilderness, they're with Moses, and <clears throat> Leviticus reads this, says, Do not make yourselves unclean by any of these things, for by all these things, I'm sorry, for by all these, meaning these unclean things, the nations I am driving out before you have become unclean clean and the land became unclean so that I punished its iniquity and the land vomited out its inhabitants Leviticus a few verses later it says lest the land vomit you out when you make it unclean as it vomited out the nation that was before you Leviticus 20 says you shall therefore keep all my statutes and my rules and do them that the, lo that the land where I am bringing you to, uh, to live may not vomit you out. So there's this idea like, hey, live in 
under the Lord. Live in step with the Lord. If not, you may be vomited out from the land. That is what, that is, what is being said in Leviticus. It shouldn't be lost on us either. In, in Revelation 3, 16, it says, So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. There is this, this getting out, getting away from me. And, and I want to say it should not be lost on us either. So what does that mean for us? Last week, I encouraged us to return to the Lord in prayer. Today, I want to encourage us on how to do that. I want to show us the heart of repentance. And that's our sermon series title is A, a Heart of Repentance. So the first application point that I want us to take home is to see God for who He is, right? Our hearts don't simply change because we want to try harder. Our hearts change when we see God for who He really is. You might recall uh, in Isaiah chapter 6 where Isaiah is kind of not wanting to do what the Lord is calling him to. The Lord reveals Himself to Isaiah and Isaiah says, Woe is me. He properly sees himself in light of the majesty and the greatness and the grandness and the glory of God. Our first step, guys, is to see God for who he is. See him for who he is. The second step, let the Lord search you. Let the Lord search you. Psalm 139 23 and 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Excuse me. Allow the Lord to search your hearts. Lay before the Lord completely open, completely exposed and let him search you <clears throat> allow the holy spirit to expose the sin the brokenness in your life as christians we should not we should not lean towards the mindset that we're good but we should lean towards the mindset of i am a sinner and christ makes me good right not, not the oh i'm good i got this i'm okay no like i'm Sin, there is sin in my veins. Yes, Jesus has, has, has died for my sins and he has made me clean, but I am not fully uh, restored. I'm not fully sanctified until, until the Lord calls me home. And so, Lord, continue to chip away, continue to chisel at the sin, at the brokenness in my life. We must battle with this brokenness. Pray to the Lord. We have the Holy Spirit. As Christians, the Holy Spirit resides in us. He lives in us. Holy Spirit, search me. Search my heart. Show me where I am weak. Show me where I am falling short. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts and see if there be any grievous way in, in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Let the Lord search you. Application point number three. No, uh, call your sin by name. So see the Lord for who He is. See God for who He is. Let the Lord search you and then call your sin by name. We, I just in, in application point number two, I just encourage us that we need to we need to I, we need to allow the Lord to search us, but and, and we need to do battle with this sin. But it's it's very hard to do battle with this sin unless you know specifically what you are aiming at. My oldest son William, uh, he just started t-ball, and uh, I volunteered to be his coach. I went from coaching high school kids to coaching t-ball kids. I love it. 
Um, but he's always excited and he's always like, Daddy, 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 are we going to practice today? Is it? And, and he wants to go to practice. When we get home, he wants to go in the backyard. He wants to get on the tee. He wants to keep doing Matthew. He, 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 can't, he can't practice. Matthew's not playing yet. But at the house, man, Matthew's right there with him getting grounders and the whole deal. They love it. He loves it. Uh, it's so fun. But being the coach, I, I try and, and, and think of different ways to improve practice. Like, what can we do better? What, what is an area that, that, that of practice that wasn't so good, that the kids aren't understanding, and how could we improve it? And so usually uh, when I'm on the treadmill, my, my human hamster wheel, <laughs> uh, I am running and my, my mind goes off and I start to think about these issues, right? And so one of the issues or, or, or one of the things that, 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 that we did that I wanted to improve on was our batting practice. And so, uh, but at one of our practices, we were teaching the kids how to swing. And so we get them in their stance and, you know, their helmets are like way too big for their, for their bodies. And the bats are like so heavy that they're like falling all over the place. <clears throat> but we managed to get them in their stance and, and we tell them to get the chicken wing. And so they get the chicken wing up and, and then they swing. And so they go to swing and they swing and they spin and they spin and they spin and they look like they're a helicopter that's trying to like ascend into the sky. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, man, that was, that was a good first practice, but that's probably not a good practice. And so uh, how can we develop that? And so that night I went home and I was on the treadmill and I was running and I was thinking, like, what could, how could we make that drill better? What could we do to make that drill more effective? And so the next time in practice, what we did is we set up the drill the exact same way. But what I, what I did was is I put a little plastic bottle on the fence in front of them. And I said, okay, guys, when you hit the ball, you're aiming for that specific target. And I just thought it'd be fun. But once I announced that to the kids, I just started like, oh, that's so awesome. I was like, what's going on? But it's this idea. The kids, they, they wanted intention behind their swing. They didn't just want to swing and try and take off into the sky. But they wanted to know that their swing was going to hit the ball and they were going to try to hit that specific targets. They wanted something to aim at, right? Something to aim at gave them intention behind their actions. We might be having a hard time fighting sin because we don't know exactly what we're aiming at. When we talk about our sin, you know, we talk about it so vaguely. It's hard to hit something uh, when you don't know what you're aiming at. Call it for what it is. Name your sin, right? If you struggle with coveting, wanting things, don't just say, Lord, help me to be content, although we should say that, absolutely say that. But you could continue on, develop that a little further by specifically stating the things that you are being covetous, coveted tis, toward, that you are wanting. So, Lord, I, I, I want that new iPhone. Now, there's nothing wrong with having iPhones, but I want that new one because my neighbors have that new one, my friends have that new one, and mine, it looks a little bit cheapy, and they're going to, and I just want that one because that's, that's a new thing. I pray that way. Lord, you might be saying, Lord, help my destructive habits. Again, that's not a bad thing, but be take it further. Be more specific. Lord, help me with my wanting to get drunk, especially after a long day's work, or especially when I go out with my friends uh, on the weekends. Lord, I have a hard time struggling with alcohol, especially in these situations Lord, help me. Lord, help my lustful thoughts. Again, that's a great start, but take it further. Lord, help me to fight pornography. Help me to fight pornography on my computer. Help me to fight pornography on my phone. Help me to fight pornography when I am isolated. Help me to fight this lustful thoughts, this pornography. Lord, help me. 
Lord, help to keep my eyes from a specific coworker. Lord, keep me from selfish ambition. Again, good general statement, but take it further. Lord, check my heart, search my heart as I'm pursuing this specific job, this new job for the city or this new job at <clears throat> in BISD or whatever it is that you're going to be working. Help me with this job, right? I want to do, or, or maybe, or maybe you're saying, you know, I want to do well at my job, but I mostly want to do well so my life would be better, so I can live the lifestyle that I want, so my coworkers can respect me. I'm more concerned, Lord, about how I will benefit uh, from this, how this will bring glory to me rather than to you, Lord. Help me. Fight against that, Lord. You know the areas that you struggle in. To fight your sin more effectively, you need to know exactly what you are targeting. You need to call your sin by name. Even after we do this, it can be difficult, which leads us to our next point, and this is the application point number four find accountability. Find accountability, right? Uh, iron, uh, Proverbs 27, uh, 27, 27 says, I'm sorry, 27, 17 says, iron sharpens iron and one man sharpens another. Find accountability. We are meant to sharpen each other. Find someone of the same gender, and I cannot ex- uh, uh, stress this enough, but find someone of the same gender to be accountable to. Guys, you don't need to be sharing the intimate details of your life with the women. And ladies, you do not need to be sharing the intimate details of your life with the men. You don't do this unless it's your spouse. But you might be thinking, but they're my best friend. (laughs) I'm going to sound harsh. I don't find another best friend. Okay? This is for the sake of protecting hearts. There are plenty of people you could find accountability under. This is where community comes into play. When Elise and I were just friends, man, I wanted to talk to her all the time. I still do. She's awesome. But when we were just friends, I wanted to talk to her all of the time. And so <clears throat> I didn't know any of this stuff. And I was like, okay, well, I'm having an issue with this. How do I work through it? You know, how do I? And as I grew, I was like, mm, maybe I shouldn't be talking to her. And by God's grace, I was plugged into a great church in McAllen where I was able to share my struggles, share my concerns, share my heart with other men around me. Such a great, great time in my life. Man. And again, I wanted to share it with Elise. I wanted her to know all these things, but it wasn't, especially with my wife, especially with her, she was not my wife at the time, it wasn't the right time to share that stuff with her, right? Maybe this person that, that you want to talk to, maybe there will become a time where, you, you know, that you all say you get married, I don't know, but then you can share with these people. But generally speaking, man, guys, fine guys, girls, fine ladies, and, and make those people your accountability people. Find someone uh, a little further along in their walk as a Christian and confide in them. Right? Ask them to help you be accountable. Ask them to ask you specific questions. Be precise. Right? It, it, it's one thing to come before the Lord and expose this stuff to Him. And again, that should be our, our biggest fear. But it's also a fear knowing that my friend is going to ask me when I see him on Tuesday night. If you need help finding someone, ask the elders. We can get you linked with someone appropriate. Go to your GC leaders. The point here is to seek accountability. Hebrews uh, 10 says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. To 
<clears throat> I encourage us, guys, come together, uh, find accountability, link up with people to keep you accountable to do what Scripture tells us to do. To sum up, guys, as we see from this story, God opposes the proud. Right? God spits out the wickedness, right? The wicked nations that we saw earlier, the wicked, spits them out. He, he opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. God doesn't want a proud heart. God doesn't want your proud hearts and all the great things that you have done. He, he wants a, 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 a scripture says he, broke, he requires a broken and contrite heart, a heart that knows that it does not have all the answers. And we come to him, we come to Jesus in our brokenness. May we come to him in this brokenness that he may restore us. We are broken, and He died for our sins, right? Normally, being broken, we are naturally separated, removed from God. There is no chance. There is no way I'll come in to save us. The Lord is not going to save us normally. But Jesus died on the cross to forgive our sins, to forgive my sins, to forgive your sins, that we may be reunited with Him. Come to the Lord with a humble heart. Come to the Lord with a repentant heart. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you that we we're able to come together um, and just study your word and hopefully grow in our love for you and our obedience towards you. And Lord, I pray that I pray that we are sweetly broken this morning, Lord. I pray that we are wholly surrendered to you, Lord, in our brokenness, in our ugliness, in our uncleanness. Lord, you make us whole. You make us clean. You restore us, Lord. We thank you for that. Lord, we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> All right, guys. Uh, well, I love you guys, and thank you for joining us this morning. Um, I'm looking forward to the day when we can all just sit around uh, and you'll be able to join us again in person. I love you guys. I miss you guys, and I will see you all soon.